Welcome to the Confident Retirement Podcast. Is doing the most important things alone a good idea? How comfy are you with your choices when it comes to life's biggest decisions? What is real peace of mind with financial confidence and how can you get it? Chris Fleming and Mark Peachy are the founders of LPF Advisors in Sarasota, Florida. On the show, they bring together the best and brightest minds to share with you how to have a more confident financial picture. They empower listeners with simple, common sense and financial wisdom. And now, here are your hosts from LPF Advisors. I want to welcome everybody to the Confident Retirement Podcast brought to you by LPF Advisors. I'm your host, Chris Flaming, and today I have the privilege of welcoming Matthew Erskine to the show. His estate planning and private fiduciary firm based in Worcester, Massachusetts, helps families with their unique asset and estate needs. Using an empathetic and approachable style, Matthew creatively and holistically assists clients and their families in achieving peace of mind with respect to their financial legacies. A true New Englander, a fourth generation attorney, and a regular contributor of thought-provoking articles to industry and trade publications. Matthew, welcome to the show. Thank you, Chris. Um, Just because I know that my uh, family will jump on me if I don't correct you, it's it's Worcester, not Worcester. Oh, that's right. Yes, yes. That's that Midwestern pronunciation coming out. (laughs) You're in the Midwest where they actually taught you, you know, how to pronounce words. Right. We're in the East where we just hear it from our family. But thank you again for inviting me on the uh, podcast. Yeah, we're going to have a lot of fun. So you have a really interesting history when I was researching you and and preparing for today on how you came to be where you are now. So take us through kind of your history and what led you to be uh, where you are in your practice and in your business. Well, as as you mentioned, it's genetic to a certain degree. Um, My uh, great-grandfather first started practicing trust and estate laws in the 1870s. And my grandfather joined him, and my father joined my grandfather, and I joined my father in 1987. My father's 97 now, and he still comes into the office about once a week. But I was a uh, medieval history major in college, and I didn't think I was going to be going into uh, the legal profession. But in reality, uh, trust and estates law is quite different than litigation. Mm. Uh, litigation gets you out of trouble. Yeah. Trust and estates law keeps you from getting into trouble. Mm. So it's a lot more research and a lot more sort of um, taking a look at what is possible to do. And there was also a gap in, in the way that I saw things, particularly on the issue of succession of ownership of stuff, yeah. artwork. Uh, collectibles, family businesses, coins. I've got a client who collects grand pianos. And in part, it was, uh, that's the family firm. And in part, it's a fascinating area for somebody who was trained as a historian to go and find out about all these things. Right. Yeah, you can glean on that from having the history background. So what's an easy way to explain why a comprehensive estate plan for like those unique assets is important? what it is, what, what it accomplishes? Well, easy way to explain it. Well, <laughs> you're asking a lawyer here. I, I don't think I can do this easily. Uh, but what it is, is that when people have tangible assets, yeah. they actually almost become, at least economically, irrational. The ownership and control of those assets are oftentimes more important emotionally to them than it is financially. Mm. And so planning for the ownership, the succession of ownership of a family house, a collection, a family business requires that you plan not only for this is the best way of avoiding paying taxes, Mm -hmm. but also this is the best way of avoiding having a knockdown drag out family fight. Right. Wow. That's really well said. Yeah. And uh, that's where the problems arise, right? on the emotional side afterwards. There's no, there, there's no fight like a family fight. Right. I know that from having brothers and sisters. <laughs> it, even in a family business, it's not about 
what you're talking about. It's the fact that you tore my Barbie's do head doll's head off when I was three years old, and I'm yeah. still pissed at you. And right, you're, right. You know, 67. Yeah, we're yeah. still holding grudges, right. So if you could go back in time and, and talk to the younger you when you started your firm or your practice, um, what would you tell that person? So there's some things that you know now that you wish you would have known when you started out? Uh, yes. I think it's probably common with every lawyer, which is, listen to your clients more okay because when you get out of law school they think you think that you know everything and in mm. fact you know nothing mm. the second thing is is work on how to resolve conflicts in a win-win situation mm. because you know it's not like uh, litigation where you have a winner and you have a loser yeah very often and you have a fight in the estate planning what you end up with is two losers Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that that's very important. And um, also, learn more about computers. Uh, <laughs> I'm afraid that when I was in college, uh, we were still using a VAX PDP 1011, yeah. where you had to program it on IBM cards. And I understand computers, but I couldn't program them. Mm -hmm. And I think in this day and age, that's very important. Mm. I'd like you to elaborate on the concept of uh, numismatic and American collections. So I, I, I'm dumb here. I don't even know what that numismatic word means. So I'd like you to kind of uh, enlighten us on what that means, what those are, and, and what they do. Numismatics is the hobby of collecting coins that were okay. actually used as currency. Okay. If you, uh, in other words, you have different types of coins. Uh, you have coins that were like a, a quarter you have a quarter that's been minted today, it is intended to be used as currency, yeah. but it may become collectible. And usually when you have a collection, it's because people, you know, just start, mm -hmm. they get an interest. They're five years old and they find a, an interesting penny on the, on the sidewalk. Let's say it's uh, one of the old uh, copper, uh, what they call wheat pennies, which yeah. has Abraham Lincoln on it. Mm -hmm. And then they go and find that they can, you know, buy those for five or 10 cents each. And they could start getting all the way from the first year, 1909, that they start made those pennies to uh, when they stopped making those mm -hmm. pennies uh, in the 1950s. And it's very easy to do that. And then they find that there are certain key coins that they really would like to have, which are relatively rare. Mm. 1955, they had an error, and the dice had struck twice, and it's called a 1955 double die. Hmm. And those are relatively rare. And then you've got extremely rare coins. Hmm. There's a coin, uh, again, staying with pennies. There is a uh, 1909 was when they first started it. The engraver put his initials on the, the coin, and it's VBD was his initials, mm. but he wasn't supposed to. So they said, don't do that. And the order went across the country and that minted the fewest of the coins that had the initials on it was San Francisco, which is S mint mark. Uh -huh. So if you have an, if you have an S VBD 1909 Lincoln wheat penny, instead of it being five or 10 cents, which is basically the copper value of it, yeah. it could be 30 or it could be 30 or $40,000. Wow. Mm -hmm. Because there's people out there who want to build their collection. Mm -hmm. And this is the last coin they need. Wow. So numismatics is the collection of coins that were actually currency. Okay. And when you have a, a numismatic collection, uh, people tend to uh, do either what, uh, what are sometimes called a type collection. Mm -hmm. I want every penny that was made of this particular series. Okay. You also have people who collect basically everything in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've had clients who have had 10,000 coins. Um, and it's just because they love collecting coins. Yeah. And is that, is that true with Americana? I mean, cause Americana to me, I would think that would be historical, but it could also be pop culture as well. So how did, how is that defined? Uh, Americana is defined as anything that is either, uh, which is iconic of America, okay. or I should say the United States of America. 
And uh, generally, however, it is uh, not fine art like mm -hmm. oil paintings and sculpture and mm -hmm. uh, nowadays digital art. Mm -hmm. It is more what is sometimes called functional art, mm -hmm. which is furniture. I had a client, a client who collected hat boxes. Mm -hmm. Back in the day when you'd have, you know, Abraham Lincoln with yeah. the big tall hat, yeah. you wanted to preserve it by putting it in the box. Mm -hmm. And these boxes, some of them were very elaborate. Um, I'll tell you this much. It takes up a lot of space to have a whole bunch of hot hat boxes. Yeah. So it's anything that, you know, related to uh, useful things in the United States. Some of them are okay. decorative. You have craft art like um, weather vanes. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it is useful, but it's also uh, decorative. Right. And I saw on your website that you also act in the capacity of a private fiduciary. So uh, help, help me understand what the functions are of a, of, of a private fiduciary. Yes, uh, I'm following in the family footsteps because all of my, you know, my father and my grandfather, my great grandfather, all acted as uh, trustees mm. or as executors of clients' estate. Okay. And there is a real um, dilemma in hiring a fiduciary. Uh, because you want it to be the person can relate to the family. Mm. So people tend to, you know, get your Uncle Joe or they get their business partner, something like that. The, the problem is that, you know, once Uncle Joe has access to all the money, that's a very large temptation. Yeah. And even though they would never, never have thought of doing it, there's no way of really preventing them from misappropriating things. Mm -hmm. If they're the sole trustee and on the other hand, there are banks and trust companies which do this as a institutional and up until probably 15, 15 years ago, we always use a uh, bank local trust company as the co-trustee. But with all the local banks being merged together and everybody becoming Bank of America or Santander yeah. or, you know, whichever is taken over in your neck of the woods, you end up not having, uh, you know, the, the relationship that you need mm. to be able to provide for a client. So, I mean, I had one situation where I was going through a trust officer about once every six months. And, oh, wow. you know, I had a, uh, the widow was in a nursing home and one of the children had special needs issues mm. and there was a house down on the Cape. And I'd have the trust officer calling up and saying, why are we mowing the lawn once a week? I'm like, because they want to mow the lawn once a week. What are you calling me about? I think it should go every two weeks. I'm like, no, this is not your role. So yeah. we act as private fiduciary and then hire outside advisors for managing the assets, for doing the tax returns and things like that. But we're trying to keep control for the client and be responsive to what the client needs. Mm. Yeah, that's insightful. That's very helpful. So let, let's switch gears just a little bit. I'm curious what you like best about your business right now. So the business of doing what you do, what do you like best right now? Uh, what I like best right now is that I get to solve people's problems. Okay. Can you uh, elaborate uh, on that? Well, many times people come to a lawyer after they have a problem and say, get me out of this. Yeah. What my job is, is to figure out, you know, because of state planning, you could be talking about 20, 30, 40 years in the future. Yeah. You actually have to anticipate all the possibilities that a client could go through and be able to react to it. Um, what I say is you always have to have a plan B. In other words, it, I just actually uh, wrote an article on this uh, in Forbes, which is what happens if the CEO of your family business develops dementia? And there was a case in Upper New York State where the widow was a um, became the C CEO and developed dementia, yeah. and the company company imploded. Her family was alienated, and she basically got ripped off by her hairdresser, who just, she made the CEO of the company. Mm. Um, mm. So that's what I enjoy uh, is being able to solve people's problems. And doing it, I guess, in advance of it becoming a real issue, right? Like what you were talking about, you can head off some of those things. Okay, so... My, uh, my ambition in life is to be able to 
get the clients what they need before they know they need it. Right. That's well said. That's well said. So do you think there's a big misconception that people have about your line of work or just, you know, the type of work you do in general? Yes. Uh, I think there's a big misconception on the part of attorneys in that they think it's dull, hmm. where in okay. fact it's not. Okay. I mean, everyone thinks that uh, the, you know, trust and estates plan attorney is sort of an afterthought. You know, mm -hmm. you have the M&A attorney, you have the litigation attorney, you have the corporate thing, and, and oh, well, yeah, you should probably go talk to Joe in the back room about your revising your will and your trust. Mm -hmm. uh, on the estate planning side, many times people say is, oh, I don't need that now. Mm. I don't right. have enough assets. Yeah. I don't really, you know, they, they, what, what do I need this for? And I say, well, what you need it for, even if you have, you know, a, you know, you rent your own, you rent an apartment and you've got a thousand dollars in the bank. The yeah. reason why you do an estate plan is because you want to keep in control. Mm -hmm. If something happens to you, mm -hmm. if you become incapacitated in some way, you want to be able to say, well, this person over here is going to manage my finances and that person over there is going to make, be able to talk to my doctor and I want things to go this way. Yeah. And uh, I actually, when COVID first started out, you know, everybody's always on, you know, various Facebook groups and things like that. And I, I had a Facebook group um, that I was a member of and I actually said to the members of the group, I will help you get a durable power of attorney and a healthcare proxy done because this disease is sufficiently serious mm -hmm. that if you get it, you may well be incapacitated and you may be incapacitated for months mm -hmm. and you need to take care of this. I don't care if you don't have any assets, mm -hmm. you need to do this just to stay in control. Yeah. So it's a question, it's a question of how do you stay in control? The next issue is making sure that once you've got that control level, it's the law of unintended consequences. What I often find is that particularly when people have multiple planners, they have plans that are in conflict with each other. Mm -hmm. yep. So you've got a retirement plan and you've got a business plan and you've got a uh, investment plan and you've got a, an insurance plan. It's bringing those all in together so that they work together. Yeah, I, you, you've actually jumped uh, forward and you didn't even know it to one of my questions. I was going to ask you about why integrating the planning of multiple professionals is so advantageous. So just say that again, because I think it's so important why, why you do that. Well, it, as I said, it's the law of unintended consequences. So I have a, uh, let's say I, I have somebody who wants to make sure that their kids are taken care of. And so they are going to designate their children as the beneficiaries of their retirement plan. Yeah. And they're going to give their spouse, you know, house and, and the other assets. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a perfectly legitimate situation. And they go to their Schwab or Fidelity or wherever it is, and they do the designation. The problem is there that if the retirement plan had gone to their spouse, the spouse could roll over the retirement plan and defer paying the income taxes. Right. But seeing as it's going to be going to the children, right. they're going to have to pay all the taxes within 10 years. And so you might want to say, well, from an income tax perspective, mm -hmm. you know, the, your accountant would say, no, 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 don't do that. But from an investment perspective, the investment guy wouldn't be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Conversely, the accountant may say, you know, you should really be an S corporation, mm -hmm. right? And uh, because it's tax efficient and things like this. And then you, um, your insurance agent comes in and says, you know, you should have key man insurance. Yeah. Well, you key, the, the S corporation buys the key man insurance. And now you have insurance inside of an S corporation, which may not be able to transfer those estate and income tax yep. free right. um, the way it's done. Insurance yeah. agent got you a great policy. Yeah. Your accountant has done exactly what he needs to do from a tax perspective, but the two of them have never sat in the same room saying, I'm thinking of doing this. Right. What do you think? Yeah, that's so true. Having someone with the wealth oversight or who's quarterbacking or overseeing everything and having those people talk together 
to make sure they're on the same page for the client. That's so important. Do you think there are some common overlooked areas when you're meeting with clients, some blind spots, things they don't see um, that commonly come up when you're working with them, things they're not even aware of? Yep. Uh, First one is tell them what you're thinking. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, There was a a woman, she had started and operated her own company. She'd been divorced. She had, her son was in the company. He was their basically uh, chief salesman. This is a um, manufacturing company. Okay. And I'm, I'm sitting there and she's saying, well, you know, when my son takes over the company from me and does this and that and the other, I want it like this. And, you know, I could see the sun squirming a little bit. And I finally said to him, do you want this company? And he said, no, I don't want to be the CEO. I just want to be a salesman. I love selling, but I just hate the idea of doing HR, of yeah. doing all this administration, of dealing with the financing. Just give me something to sell and I can sell it. And she practically fell out of her chair because mm. she had never actually talked to her son about what he wanted. Yeah, And I said, so we're talking about a different plan here. We're not talking about succession of ownership. We're talking about how do you sell the company and make sure Mm -hmm. your son's got a good job. Yeah. So that's the first thing I would say is talk to people. Yeah. Uh, Let them know what you're thinking. And uh, the second thing I would say is uh, review it fairly regularly. I tell people that after you get through, uh, you know, Christmas Day, and and you're f- still feeling generous to people. Uh, sit down and think about what you're going, what's going to happen in the next year, and and what would happen if your estate plan was going to be implemented. Yeah. Um, and you still got that rosy glow that yeah, my family isn't that horrible, but you don't have to do a comprehensive review, but you just think about it and say, you know, things have changed. Uh, my daughter's gotten married, or my uh, his son is divorced, or I now have 16 grandchildren. Mm-hmm. Maybe I should make some changes. Yeah. Yeah. We see that as being so important, meeting regularly with clients on an annual or, or a more frequent basis because things change and that could impact what they want to do with their investments or their financial planning in their estates. So you've got a lot of life experience, Matthew. So I'm, I'm curious what your first memory or experience is with money. So this could be when you were a little kid, maybe an adolescent. Your first memory could be positive or negative that you had personally with money. The first relationship I ever had with money was, now, I grew up on a farm. It's okay. a family farm. It's been in right. the family forever. And my parents took it over from my grandparents, but my grandparents still lived next door when I was growing up. Mm-hmm. And my grandmother didn't like the fact that there were weeds in the lawn. So she gave me this little metal thing that looked sort of a fork yep. sort of thing that you can dig out dandelions with. Yes, I know exactly what you're and, talking about. Yeah. And she I was about I think I was five or six years old and she said, I'll give you a penny for every ten of these that you dig out. Okay. And for the rest of that summer, all I ever did was dig holes in the lawn. <laughs> uh it sort of uh reminds me of the fact that, you know, you you can motivate people if you pr- properly, you know, have resources uh, to do things that they otherwise wouldn't do. Yeah. And that's where the whole incentives thing come in, right? If the incentives are proper or, or appropriate, you can make, uh, or not make, but you can get people to act. They'll choose what's in well, their best it, interest. But when you are doing, I mean, I've seen the, the incentive trusts. And, um, you know, one of the things that I use is something which is called systems dynamics. Mm. which is a way of being able to map out how people normally will react in a certain Mm. situation. Mm -hmm. And when you do something like that and you say, well, if you do well in your job, you'll get more money. It's what's called success to the successful, Mm. which means that if you have somebody who needs some help but and is unsuccessful, you're not giving them the resources to be able to become successful. Mm. Whereas the person who is successful and has the resources gets more. 
Mm-hmm. And sometimes you end up having a situation where it's, you know, you don't intend for it to be a bad situation, but it can be. So sometimes when you're putting together a plan like that, you need to say, well, what's really going to happen here? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's knowing something about human nature. So you've probably seen both the positive and the negative effects of wealth when you're dealing with families going through certain life events. So Mm -hmm. um, money's not really a negative or a positive thing in itself. It's kind of a means. So on the negative side or the positive side, how have you seen planning or the lack of planning um, contributing to either frustration or success when it comes to those life events that trigger an estate plan being put into place? One of the ways is that people aren't held responsible for their actions, that they are so constrained on their access to money Mm. that no matter what they do, they're still going to have access to money. Mm -hmm. You know, the so-called trust fund babies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it is, you know, very difficult sometimes to get people, you know, who feel that there is an open-ended tap. I tend to do things by stories. So we, we had a client woman, she had three or four children, three of whom were right successful and her youngest child, her youngest son, was a complete waste of time. Mm. Lived with mom until she died. And my father said, well, would you like to set up a trust for your younger child? Because he doesn't seem to be able to manage money. And she said, no, he gets a share. And, you know, I don't want to put it in trust. Yeah. Well, his three siblings were outraged because they were convinced he was going to blow it all and then be on their doorstep saying, Mm -hmm. please give me money. So my father sat down with him. I was with him. And he said to him, here's your money but your siblings are happy to see you for Thanksgiving and Christmas and everything else, unless you talk about money, in which case they want to have nothing to do with you. And several years later, I saw him and I said, how are things going? He said, actually, pretty well. And I said, you know, we were really nervous that you weren't going to be able to handle your finances, but you seem to have been able to do that. He said, yeah, you know what the big difference was? And I said, no, he said, no safety net. So sometimes... The way to get somebody to do the right thing is to make it that they are putting their own money at risk. Right. So kind of switch that around and give the, put the personal responsibility on them to either succeed or, and there was no, there yep. was no plan, there was no plan B. Yep. And, 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 you know, it, there was no consequences for his actions. Mm-hmm. I'm curious what, again, switching gears, um, I'm curious what you would think personally, your biggest life accomplishment is, either professionally or personally? So biggest life accomplishment. Personally? Well, getting married and having three kids. Uh, okay. There's not much, much, not much that you could do that would be better than that. Yeah. Uh, I, my children, uh, my oldest is MD, PhD down at Duke University. My uh, middle child is uh, a ER nurse up in Keene, New Hampshire, and my third is a um, uh, software product developer in Oakland, California. Uh, they're making more money than I am, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, how are we going to keep the practice going? That None of those seem like they're easily transferable over to the law. Well, I figure, though, that if I'm going to work as long as my father has, I've still got 30 or 40 years to go, so I'm okay. not too worried about it. So there it. might be a Maybe grandchild one of the grand- in there. Yeah, there there be a grandchild in there. <laughs> I like it. Um, Either that, or I can. I, I'm I'm willing for enough money to adopt people. Right. I was just going to suggest that that would that could be a that could be a possibility. What if you weren't doing what you're doing now? What What do you think you'd be doing instead? Was there? So I know you're a, were a history medieval history major in college, but was there something growing up? I want to be one of these, or I think I want to go into this, or I think I want to do that. Well, I think that. Um, you know, if I hadn't been bitten by the legal bug, yeah. uh, I'd probably uh, be teaching. Okay. All right. I could definitely uh, see that. In that, you know, many times what I'm doing in, in this is trying to take very complicated things and make them simple enough that people who are smart, but perhaps inexperienced in dealing with these things yeah. can understand it and yeah, getting them to think outside of the box. Mm-hmm. Yeah, taking a complex um, issue or complex legal thing and being able to simplify it where they can understand it and see how it fits, 
Um, that that's a true skill. Um, we do that a lot. Tell stories and try to explain things in ways that people would understand. I grew up on a farm for a few years. I usually use some farm analogies uh, as well when it comes to some of the concepts that we discuss with people when we're doing financial planning. So outside of your practice, Matthew, tell me something that you are really passionate about um, personally. Do you have some outside passions or things that you're really into? Well, I try and continue on the family collections. Okay. Uh, we have a coin collection. We have a book collection. Because we never move, we've got a whole bunch of old furniture. Okay. Uh, we've been, history is, is an area, and trying to understand how things, uh, uh, my great aunt wrote historical novels. Uh, my great grandmother was one of the first women who were genealogists okay. uh, in this area. So that's the sort of thing that I, I get involved with. And in part, it's because uh, of the family legacy. But mm -hmm. what I usually say to people is, look, if you tell your family story, it means that everybody can participate. Mm -hmm. That if, you know, and it doesn't matter if you're, I have clients that are immigrants from Kenya. Mm -hmm. uh, but I say, you know, write it down, tell people about it. Make sure that people understand who you are and where you're from and what was important to you because 50 or 100 years from now, you won't be around to tell them. Yeah. So and, that, and every, that, that's... Everyone has a unique story, right? There are no two that are the same. Yeah. Yes. And everybody has a story that's worthwhile telling. Absolutely. Talk to me about your writing. Um, how do you come up with your subjects, uh, your topics that you cover? And how do you prepare or, or research those things that you end up writing about? I am a fairly eclectic reader. Okay. And so I will look at different things and I will say, you know, and I, I've done enough uh, research on various things that I'm going to, I usually say, well, what's the consequences of this particular change? So, mm -hmm. for instance, um, I'll read in the newspaper that and they want to make changes to the income tax law so that you have to pay capital gains every yeah. 21 years. Right. And I sat down and said, you know, how would this actually work? Mm -hmm. What if you had uh, bought a piece of land, um, which is now in suburbia, but you're still operating your farm off of it? How mm -hmm. would you actually deal with that? And that's many times what I, I write about. The other thing is, is that there are times when people don't realize exactly how inconsistent they are being. Mm -hmm. And so I write about that. And part of it is I just find something I say, well, this is kind of interesting. I bet you other people would find it interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's so easy for us to spot the uh, inconsistencies in other people and not so much ourselves. I, and you know something? One of the things that I learned from my father a long time ago is you have to remain humble. Mm. because you well could be wrong. Right. So don't block off the fact, you know, listen to what people are saying yes. and consider it and see whether or not, in fact, you're wrong and they're right. And for the client's benefit, you should do what they say. Yeah. And uh, ultimately what it boils down to is people, you know, they just want to be heard. They want to be listened to. And that's almost I, a lot of having that compassion, empathy is almost a lost art. Well, I think that uh, particularly now, what people more need more of is being empathic, mm -hmm. particularly with the COVID disruption. Yeah. Uh, nobody feels like anybody's got their back. Right. Yeah. And uh, makes it very, very difficult if you're going to treat somebody like they're, you know, take a number and go up to the deli and get your sandwich. Yeah. Yeah. No one wants to feel like a number. What do you think it, what do you think is the most exciting part about your business right now? So you own your own business. What's what's the most exciting thing right now in your business? Most exciting thing about what I'm doing in my business is the fact that probably in the next 20 years there's going to be an enormous amount of art and collectibles and businesses that are going to transfer mm. ownership. Okay. And there are some very interesting opportunities to be able to make that transition work smoothly 
mm-hmm. and be able to not end up just sort of having a fire sale at the end of the day. Yeah. In large part, all of that stuff could be avoided with some with some proper planning in advance, right? If you give me enough time, I can do almost anything. <laughs> the problem is that when you have the client who, and I have had this happen once, yeah. you know, my husband has just had a stroke. We're headed to the yeah. hospital. Would you meet us there so he can sign the papers? Right. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully he can still understand what I'm right. saying. But, right. And, you know, just like compound interest. If you take a plan, I mean, right now there's a lot of discussion over whether or not if they do make changes to the estate tax Tax. law, will it be retroactive back to the first of the year? Well, people could see this was coming two years ago. Yeah. And I have clients that have now executed everything, but it was done last year. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to rush around trying to figure out how to do this. And so, yes, if if you're willing to take make the changes and take the steps, you can really leverage things quite significantly. I think we might have found your new motto. If you give me enough time, I can do almost anything. <laughs> well, it's either that either that, or it's the other thing that I tell clients, which is, again, trying to get them to tell me what they want. I say, tell me what you want. I'll see if I can make it legal. Right. <laughs> On the flip side of that question, what do you consider to be your biggest challenge? So we talked about your opportunity. What's your biggest challenge in your business right now or obstacle? The biggest challenge, the biggest obstacle in the the business right now is that things are moving so fast. Mm, Okay. It is that people feel that uh, they don't have any time to sit down and try and figure it out we got to do this and we got to do that. We got to do this other thing and let's hurry up and hurry up. And when in reality, they're only going to change one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. So it is better to be fairly deliberate to say, yes, we need to make this change. But that's step three. Yeah. Step one is we need to make this change because it's going to make the most impact with the least amount of time and money involved. So, you know, yes, we should have a complete restructuring of the family business. But right now, what we're going to do is go out and get buy-sell agreements mm-hmm. because that's we can do that. It'll have a huge impact because it'll give us control if somebody dies and it's going to be relatively efficient, you know, low cost and mm-hmm. time, less time than trying to restructure the whole company. Everybody wants the quick fix, the solution. They want to jump to the thing that they think is the most important. Um, we have to be there for them to walk them through the steps they need to take to do it in the right order. One of the things that's frustrating sometimes is you'll get another professional, an accountant or a lawyer or an insurance agent or a financial planner, and that really wants to be able to do exactly the same thing as they just did for their last client. Mm -hmm. And so they say, well, you should have, you know, a this. Yeah. Whatever this is, it's an insurance product, it's a trust, it's a you know retirement plan or whatever. Why? Well, it works so well for my last client. I'm like, yeah, but you know, your last client was 45 years old with two kids and a wife and had a yeah. uh, you know a medical practice. Where this guy is 85 years old, he's widowed, he has older kids, and he's got a manufacturing business. This yeah. doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. The solutions aren't customized. Well, as they say, you've seen one family business or you've seen one collection, you've seen one family business or collection. Every one of them is different. Yeah. Do you think there's a question that I should have asked you or do you want to expand on anything that you said earlier? Well, I'm sure there is going to be a question, but I'll probably think about it in about 45 minutes. (laughs) But no, I guess it's, you know, what should you do next? And somebody says, you know, gee, I really need to do an estate plan. Well, what you really should do is is sit down and say, is what I'm doing going to get the assets to who I want when I want to get it there? And are, if it's not, then maybe we should do something about it. Uh, because if you can't follow how things are going to evolve, if you are incapacitated or you die, I can absolutely guarantee you that your beneficiaries aren't. Yeah, they won't be able to figure it out either. And I think that's a good lead in and sitting down with someone. If people wanted to learn more about you or they wanted to contact you, what, what's the best way to do that, Matthew? 
Probably the best way is to go to my website, which is uh, www.erskineco.com. It's Erskine Company. Uh, I got tired of writing out Erskine and Erskine on the emails. Yeah. Um, and there's that information there. There's also links to the various things that I've written. Yes. But you can also get me get in contact with me. I'm also very happy to have people. Um, well, they can check out my Forbes page, which mm-hmm. also will eventually get them to me. Uh, or they can just give me a call or shoot me an email. Both the Forbes and the the website have and uh, have my contact information. I'm on LinkedIn. I have a social media person who understands how to do Twitter, so they do Twitter. I right. don't do Twitter because. Uh, you know, just looking at the train wreck that the last administration got into with Twitter, I, I said, you know, my thumbs are too big to be able right. to do that. Yeah. Oh, you're um, tweeting. And it's just being done by somebody else. I am approving it, but they're doing it. Okay. And spell your last name for us. My last name is E-R-S-K-I-N-E. Okay. Which is because people in Scotland don't understand how to write. My ancestors, I'm the ultimate Scotch-Irish in that my father's side of the family were all Scottish for 400 years, and my mother's side of the family were all Irish for, you know, back to St. Patrick, so. Yeah. My kids don't know how to spell, and I'm not Scottish, so I don't know where all that works out, but hey, listen, Matthew, I really want to thank you for taking the time to be here with me today. Um, Honestly, your unique perspective has really been delightful, and I, I appreciate you being here. I appreciate your inviting me. Yeah, I've been here with Matthew Erskine, or Erskine, and I want to thank you all for tuning in to the Confident Retirement Podcast brought to you by LPF Advisors, where we raise the retirement confidence of everyday people to another level, one show at a time. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in, and we will see you on the next program. Take care. You've been listening to the Confident Retirement Podcast with Chris and Mark from LPF Advisors. For more information on them and retiring confidently, please visit lpfadvisors.com. If your ears are pleased and your mind is now at ease, do share the program with your friends and subscribe wherever podcasts are found.